Welcome to the Sports Study Podcast. This episode is sponsored by nobody. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking NFL and NBA. First topic will be the NBA because we just had some breaking NFL developments that happened on Saturday. So we want to talk about that at some point. But right now, Friday developments in the NBA, it was the Damian Lillard trade request or the trade that was supposed to be uh, happening to the Miami Heat. Or at least that's what Damian Lillard wants. We understand that Damian Lillard wants to uh, be traded to the Miami Heat, right? We know that. He's told people that or people close to him where his agent has let every other team know that the Miami Heat was his only destination. So now the NBA has come out and said, whoa, you can't be doing that. You can't be making statements or calling up teams or telling people, that your client, your your only wants to play for one team. NBA put out a memo to all 30 NBA teams on Friday, letting them know that this is not acceptable. What does that mean when it comes to trades with players? Absolutely nothing. Because the bottom line is, if a player doesn't want to be traded to a certain team and he has that kind of clout to 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 make it known. He will do it regardless. So I really don't see how you could punish that. But let's just talk about Damian Lillard's trade request to the Miami Heat. And what does that mean if he gets his way and ends up on the Heat? Now, I still don't see that deal. I don't think that puts Miami in a position to win a title. I think Damian Lillard might be one of the most overrated players in NBA history. Not saying that Damian Lillard is not a good player, because he is. I'm saying he's overrated based on where he's been placed all time. He made the NBA 75 list, despite the fact that the guy has not really done anything in the league besides have some decent moments. When you think about the 75 greatest players in league history... These are guys, how many players have come through the NBA? Thousands and thousands of guys have played in the NBA and have done some, and, and many of them have done some special stuff, right? And to put guys in on this list, like Damian Lillard, and there's a couple other guys on that list that's like, I think Anthony Davis made the list a few years ago, and it's like, before that, before the bubble run with LeBron, he hadn't won anything, right? And he was always hurt. These are guys who are barely on the court now. They're playing like 40, 50 games, where guys back then were playing 82 games, 35, 36, 7, 8, 38 minutes a night, making deep playoff runs. But for some reason, these guys are half-assing it, and they're still being considered the best players of all time. This is why I think that the NBA 75 list is a complete joke. It is more so about trying to keep the popularity contest. Hey, you know, it's more so about who's popular. That's what the All-Star game has become. That's what the All-NBAs, all these awards have become. It's more so of a popularity contest. And even the writers and the voters who get to decide these things are basing it off of, if I be nice to this guy, I could get access to him. There's really no great NBA writers anymore. Journalists are all gone. Insiders, none of them are great. All these guys are ass kissers for access. Uh, and it's all about entertainment now. It's all about popularity and who can have the, uh, the quote or the, the hot take of the moment. So it's not really reliable. So these guys that made this, why I, this is why I don't really consider all-star appearances when talking about all-time NBA uh, greats list. I don't, I don't, I I mostly go off of all NBA appearances because it's like if you were one of the best players in the league during your era, you more likely would have made an all NBA team, would it be first or second? And I'm also stick to a first and second all NBA selection. Third, you know, you could count that if you want, but if it's like a close tie, 
between a couple of players. I'm 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 gonna go with who had more first or second team selections, because in a weak era you could possibly also be a third team All NBA guy. But when you don't make that many appearances on that list in a weak era, that is a knock on you. And usually the reason why you don't make it these All NBA teams on in a weak era is because you're probably playing on a team that's not advancing or competing or contending. And when I look at a player like Damian Lillard, who individually great, right? He's he's a great shooter. He can score. But this is a guy who has the ball in his hands 90 plus percent of the time. And your job as the leader, as the ball guy, is to get players around you better. To make guys around you better. And Lillard, unlike Curry, Lillard has not done that. Now you can say, well, he he's in Portland. And he ain't playing with no talent or this and that. They've had numerous coaches come through Portland. Numerous different people. Are you saying like every single person just can't coach? Because it's not like these guys are good players. These guys are are solid coaches, right? Sometimes the star player needs to step up. There's no reason why you should be, you should, you should, you should be making players better. When you're putting up these crazy stats, averaging 30 points per game, but the rest of your team ain't doing nothing, that's on you. The burden falls on Damian Lillard. And and if you can't do that, how can you consider yourself an NBA 75 great player when you're saying, I need, it's, it's not my fault that my team is not making playoff runs because we don't have pieces around you. No, you don't make pieces around you better. That's what's going on. We look at the all-time great guys. You even take Michael Jordan, for instance. Remember Michael Jordan went on that run where he averaged uh, 14 or 17 straight triple-doubles. He proved that he can get people involved when needed, right? The improvement of Scottie Pippen when he came in as a rookie, a bench player. Scottie Pippen became a Hall of Famer. You think Scottie Pippen would have became a Hall of Famer if he came into Chicago as a rookie and had to and there was no Michael Jordan there? You gotta be kidding me if you think that. But Pippen, raw talent, raw athleticism was able to develop because playing with guys like Michael Jordan. Most guys, even, I mean, these guys develop. You figure it out, you find a way. Even some guys now that get later in their careers, they develop their games, they become playmakers, they get guys involved. I guess his teammates evolve, they, they play better. And that's just how it goes. Think about when Curry came into the league, we knew he could shoot, but we didn't really know he had any other skill set as far as like playmaking ability. He's became a he's become a playmaker. And it's not because you could say, oh well, because they build around them and put all these pieces. Most guys, let me tell you a secret. Besides the top guys in the league, like the tip of the top guys, most of the guys in the league are all in the same range. There's really no clear cut difference and skill set. It's mostly the different, the, the typical difference between a team that is good for years, that can win titles, is typically team chemistry and extra hard work. That's it. Talent-wise, all 400 and plus guys in the NBA, they all got talent. They all can play ball. They all can play, right? You pick anyone out, drop them in any random park in any random gym in America and they're gonna light you up. So the skills is not the problem. But we talk about oh Lillard doesn't have any talent around him. No, every man in the NBA, every twelve all twelve guys on each roster can play basketball. Has they got basketball skills. So it's not the skills, it's not the talent that's the problem. But from very good players to great players is there's a there's a clear difference. Right, being able to get these guys ready. That's what Curry did. You saw the difference when Curry was out. The team was completely done. Pretty much the same roster. And they and they was barely in the playoffs. Now, if that was like Curry seven years ago and that happened, the team would have been different. But Curry built, he made himself important. That's the kind of thing I kind of respect about Curry in this era is that he made himself important. Um valuable as far as his ability and his skill set. He advanced it. Jordan advanced his skill set. 
guys, these special ones did it. Kobe did it to a certain extent in his career. This is what guys do. So when I look at Damian Lilly, I'm like, dude, you're not the you're not one of the 75 greatest ever because you haven't done that type of thing. And don't get me like I said, all star player, very really good player in this era, but. This era is the weakest era in league history, so how can you be 75 all-time great? I just don't see it. Anthony Davis had to come to L.A. and play with LeBron and be built around that. Now, Anthony Davis was a very important piece, but let's just face it. He, he didn't do it. He didn't get it done in New Orleans. He had to come to L.A. and link up with LeBron, and then he got the title. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, as much as you want to hate all you want about Dwight Howard, right? Look, I think Dwight Howard, as far as, like, is he the most complete player in this in his era? No. But he was great defensively. He didn't really develop offensive moves like he should have, but he did win a bunch of defensive players of the years. He was really good. To say that Anthony Davis is above Dwight Howard all time is kind of a joke. Now, is, is Anthony Davis more skilled than Dwight Howard? Yeah. Skill-wise, yeah. Anthony Davis is more skilled. I would say they're both... I would say Dwight has him slightly in the defensive category. But offensively, Anthony Davis has him. Has him beat. Has a but Dwight Howard career. Dwight had a better career. So I think that uh, this NBA 75 list is a joke. And I don't see Damian Lillard's trade to Miami actually doing anything uh, to help to advance Miami. Now, if you're the Heat, do you have to do this deal? Probably, because it's like, if you could do this deal without giving up some pieces, you know, you was the AC last year. Uh, I think they was in the play-in, so they could have easily not be, been in the playoffs. So you're you realizing that this team, if Milwaukee comes back healthy, Boston's going to be Boston. And with the improvement of the Cavs and who knows about the Knicks and others, you know, the, the Heat don't want to, they don't want to be playing in the bottom of the East next season. And with Lillard, yes, the Heat could potentially be a top four team in the East. Oh, uh, but so they have to improve the roster. So I don't blame Miami for making the trade. I'm just saying that I don't think that this trade would bring Miami to an NBA title. That's just my opinion. So that's it for that on the NBA. But it's going to be interesting. Next season is going to be really interesting to see what happens. I know Boston just gave Jalen Brown $300 million. They also brought in Porzingis. I have an issue with Boston uh, defensively. I don't know. I think they're going to lose a little bit defensively, but I don't think it really would matter in the NBA this era because who's playing defense anyway, right? You want guys. Boston had issues with scoring and stretches where they just – reason they just didn't uh get it done in certain moments but with Jalen Brown getting this contract we'll see if Jalen Brown can become play much better than he did last year now people have excuses to say oh the guy had an ankle and this and that and, you know so we'll find out we'll find out if it's legit or not and uh we'll see but Boston is the clear favorites to win the Eastern Conference and in my estimation, they are the clear favorites to come out the East and the uh, probably win the NBA title. So they've been the favorites for like They should have had at least two titles by now. Uh, this is my opinion. At least one, maybe even two. Choking against Golden State, then choking in the Eastern Conference Finals. It's just kind of sad. But th and, and I believe that this could be the last run for the Brown and Tatum experiment. If somehow this team struggles anything less than an NBA Finals appearance could be bad news for uh the, the uh, between Brown and Tatum. And it's not even guaranteed that Brown, I mean, Tatum could be the one gone, right? Because say if Boston, because I think Tatum is going to likely opt out after next season. I think that's when he can opt out. And after next season... After this season, Brown's contract kicks in. He can't be traded, though, to July 1st or to July of next year. So, which means after next season. So, if some reason they say, well, we want to keep Brown, and, I mean, we want to keep Tatum, they could just trade Brown. 
and they'll have suitors for Brown, even with the new contract kicking in. Or they'll keep Brown and maybe Tatum walks or it gets traded. I don't know. But either way, I still think that this is the last run unless these guys either win the title or they get to the finals. If they don't deliver, I can truly see a breakup happening. So that's my opinion on that. And that's what I believe. So the Sports Study Podcast here, we're going to be moving on to the NFL in just a second here. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube at Sports Study TV and on Twitter at Sports Study Podcast with, or Sports Study PC and Instagram at Sports Study as well and Facebook. So uh, now... If you want to be part of the podcast, you want to have be on a segment, you can send us an email at sportsteady at protonmail.com, sportsteady at protonmail.com. Any sport you want to talk about, NFL, NBA, if you're an insider, if you're someone who writes and you want to talk about anything in the news, we would love to hear from you and you can be on a future episode because the NFL is getting ready to kick off big time and we are looking for NFL people. So if you're an NFL guy, NBA guy, MLB guy, as the um, around the stretch is coming up for the MLB, we would love to hear from you. And not only for the Sports Study Podcast, also for Sports Study Live that happens whenever we get a production going. We're trying to do something nightly or at least weekly. So if you want to appear on Sports Study Live or Sports Study TV, you can also send an email at sportsstudy at protonmail.com. Sports steady at protonmail.com. Now, the NFL. A lot of talk this week about the NFL and the running back situation, about the contracts, about these guys not getting paid. They're not getting uh, the money that they believe that they're owed. And I will say this. The NFL, the running position in the NFL is it's kind of like a, it's not, it's not very valuable. It's not valued. And the reason why is because it's just it's just not a it's just too many of them, and you can get the production you can get the production from one running back with three, and pay them less. It, it, it makes no sense, and it's been this way for years, even before they negotiated new terms on the CBA. And running backs are a replaceable position, probably one of the most replaceable positions on your team. If you're building out a team, if you're building out a roster, you want to have your quarterback, obviously, you want to have a great offensive line and you want to have some pretty good wide receivers. Um, but we've seen over the years that running backs are not valuable. Just look at the last Super Bowl winners. There's no franchise running backs on these rosters, right? You go to Kansas City. You go to New England. Over the years, they've, they've had a running back by committee. Kansas City's have multiple different type of backs. They put all their stock into their tight end and their quarterback. And the obviously with Tom Brady, who would take pay cuts, but they always always had solid, not great weapons, solid weapons around them and some multiple talented guys at receiver or at running back who could do both. The new trend in Kansas City's doing it. New England did it for years. I think Kansas City's starting to copy that model just a little bit, having guys who could do multiple stuff. Um, that is the way to go. That's how you build a team for the long term. And, you, and you're and you flexible, so you want to make a trade or make a deal for a guy to bring in for a year to see if it works out, you can do it. It makes no sense to, to pay a running back $25, $30 million a year. It just makes no sense. It really doesn't. And um, and it's sad to say, it really is sad to say, because you're like, damn, uh, Jonathan Taylor's of the world, Derrick Henry's and all these guys, they all want to be paid a lot of money. And Jim Irsay came out and said, hey, let me try to get Jim Irsay's tweet up here so I can have it exact what exactly what he said. Um, Jim Irsay talked about the... Uh, what he was saying, and uh, Jim Merce says that, uh, what did he say? I'm trying to find the tweet here. I can't find it. But but Jim Merce pretty much said that the CBA and the, the CBA negotiations, they had negotiated a deal, and 
these are the terms that they came up to, and for guys now to come out and start complaining, it's kind of like kind of weak. So the agent of Jonathan Taylor came out and said that to do right by your team is to pay your your best player. So that prompted a whole big response from everybody on social media. It's like, oh my God, this is crazy. So the Colts met up with Jonathan Taylor at like a meeting and I guess they discussed some things. They probably asked him, hey, what do you want? What's the problem here? And he probably said he wanted a contract extension. The team said, look, we're not trying to do that right now. We're not ready for that, which is their, their right, right, as an organization. And it's a running back. If it was a quarterback had that kind of year, yeah, you locked the quarterback up. But a running back, you don't, there's no rush to lock him up. We could come back again, do what you did again last season or a couple seasons ago, and we'll revisit. But it's ne- you're never in a rush to ever have to pay a running back. You just don't, especially when your team didn't win. Your team was so bad that they had to draft, they was able to draft a, a quarterback early on, a top pick. So this is smart business, folks. You could like it or not, but that's how it goes. So Jonathan Taylor did not like that, and he then requested a trade. He requested a trade. So, so, and, and there's sources around the NFL saying that even though he requested a trade, I mean, the likelihood of him being traded is probably not going to happen because the contract number that he wants will not be entertained by any team in the NFL, including the Colts. So the Colts are not going to entertain that contract offer, and no other team is. It's almost like Jonathan Taylor is not reading the room, or at least his agent is not reading the room, because it's like, dude, you're ready to go to camp. Now you want to do trade requests because of a Twitter spat? Read the room, guy. Nobody's getting paid in the running backs right now. So you want a contract extension, you don't get it, now you want to be traded. So what's going to happen when you go to the new team and the new team says, we're not giving you that money either, but we'll have you for one year. Then you're going to ask for a trade there too? Jonathan Taylor or his representatives are not reading the room right now and they're kind of just jumping out the window for no reason. He could have had this shit go on. Now you distract, you're going to have a full season of distractions about the contract all season long with a young quarterback, team's going to be struggling, and all people are going to be talking about is your contract. And now you're going to lose value because even if you play well next year, the team sucks, you're going to look bad. So you should have just kept that shit to yourself and waited till the all season. all went behind closed doors and said, hey, man, look, that's what we're doing here, but I really would like to stay here. Let's work something out. But going out on Twitter and making it and jumping into the fire – you don't want to do that against the NFL owners, man. And Jim Mercy is the last guy you you want to try to bully into a contract. So sources saying that no team around the league is going to entertain that number. We don't know what that number is, but we understand that running backs are not getting big contracts. So your trade request at this point makes no sense. Jim Mercy says he will not trade Jonathan Taylor. But we'll see. Taylor has announced himself as a as a cavity in the Colts' mouth. Running backs are replaceable, and this one has an idiot for an agent. <laughs> he does have an idiot for an agent. Because that was... <laughs> oh, man. So, that's that. And a pretty interesting graph that I saw on social media about Super Bowl winning leading rushers base salary since 2009 with uh, 2022... Isaiah Pachinko salary was only eight hundred and seventy thousand. Two thousand and one Rams Cam Akers eight hundred and ninety thousand. The Bucks in twenty twenty Leonard Fournette was making two million. Now Fournette was obviously a veteran, a little bit older, so he had a bigger contract. Two thousand nineteen Chiefs Damian Williams one million dollar salary. Patriots Sony Michelle, who was a young player on a rookie deal, four hundred and eighty thousand dollars. 2017, LeGarrette Blunt, 900000 2016, LeGarrette Blunt, 760000 2015, C.J. Anderson, 585000 2014, LeGarrette Blunt. Jeez, I mean, rings LeGarrette Blunt got? 
730,000. Damn, Blunt got some rings, boy. 2013, Percy Harvin, 2.5 million. Now, Percy Harvin, if you notice, Percy Harvin does have the highest on this list because Percy Harvin was not just a running back, he was also a wide receiver that was the leading rusher, so he was valuable. And that value at that time in 2013 was only worth 2.5 million. Ray Rice in 2012, two million dollars. And Ray Rice was one of the better backs in the league at the time. 2011, Ahmad Bradshaw, 1.5 million. Packers, James Stark, 320,000 in 2010. And Pierre Thomas in 2009, $460,000. So as of this list, since 2009, guys say running backs don't make a lot of money because they're replaceable. And even off this list, there was a multiple of running backs, right? Like if I remember, the Giants had like a three-headed monster running back. The Patriots had a multiple of running backs. So did the Broncos, Eagles too, the Chiefs. And the Buccaneers had a couple other running backs. So that's just the bottom line, guys. And a lot of these guys are on their early deals or guys who are trying to redeem themselves, like like Eric Blunt, who was uh, bouncing around and getting sought to these veteran deals for, like, second chance and stuff like that. So you find these guys on these short deals, on these cheap deals. And that's why... Um, that's why you paid them the way you're paying them. Or they all rookie deals like Isaiah Pachinko and Sony Michelle. So you're not going to get the 20 plus million dollars that you think you're going to get. So Jonathan Taylor needs to just suck it up, take his butt back to camp, and and, and play football because it ain't going to happen. And just either try to get an extension that's in the favorable to where both sides can agree or play it out. And wait it out because Ursay knows he's not going to reset the market by giving this guy a huge deal where, you know, the next guy up is going to get paid. No, you don't want to do that. You don't want to be the owner to do that. And no team is going to trade and to do that. Nobody. So sorry to say it, Jonathan. It ain't going to happen. So Taylor wants out of, out, out of the Colts. Ursay is like, we're not going to trade you, but if we do... Um, if we do, we want a high round pick. Pick, and now there's news coming out. Jonathan Taylor hasn't even passed his physical. Taylor's coming off an injury last season. And he has the nerve to demand a trade. I'm just seeing this right now. Taylor didn't even pass his physical, and I'm just seeing this from Mike Chapel. It says correction. Colts running back Jonathan Taylor didn't pass pre-camp physical and then placed on PUP because he wasn't ready to practice. He was placed on PUP at the failing physical, just getting it straight. So he, not only did he pay, then he wants to have, then he wants to have the nerve to demand and to be paid like the highest running back in football. Oh my God. I mean, are you kidding me right now? You can't make this shit up. You can make it up, folks. You can't. What is going on here? This is clown world in the NFL. These running backs, they must see, they must really get hit too hard. They get hit too hard, man, because they, they're not even paying attention to what's going on. This, this is like the worst time to try to play hardball when you have no leverage. None. How about get back on the field, get healthy? How about passing a physical first? <laughs> like, seriously. Pass a physical first before you start yapping off with the owner. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. I didn't even see that part of the deal. I just saw that just now because I was I was uh, going on pre-show. I was like, you know, Dodd Taylor requesting a trade. I thought it was, that was ridiculous. No other team is going to pay him. But now I find out as I'm doing the show, I'm looking. And I'm like, oh, snap. I didn't see this caveat that this guy actually failed his physical before demanding a trade. <laughs> Dr. Taylor had a high ankle sprain six months ago. Got it cleaned up in surgery early in the offseason. So what kind of work is he doing? So early in the offseason, he had everything cleared up. 
but then he still fails the physical as we're already heading in close to preseason, coming right around the corner. We're within weeks away, and you're still not ready, but you want more money? Where are your priorities at, dude? This is why you don't pay running backs big money because they're not even ready to take the field. Guys, unbelievable. Well, that's it for this episode of the Sports Study Podcast. I'd like to thank all the people behind the scenes that have contributed to the show. Don't forget, we're on Twitter at Sports Study PC. Please give us a follow. We're on Apple iTunes and Spotify. Tune in, iHeart, and every, anywhere that you can find a podcast. If you'd like to give support, please email us at sportsteady at protonmail.com. Sportsteady at protonmail.com. Look out for videos weekly on Sports Study TV on YouTube and Facebook. We'll be going live probably some point on Saturday, Sunday. Sports Day Live will be happening as we recap the week of sports. And all that will be on YouTube. So look out for that. Give us a follow and subscribe on YouTube as well to stay up to date as we try to advance this company. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. Peace out. Sports page run by sports fans. Peace.